This is Dave Glover, and my guest once again is Jack McDonald of the Roston Museum, and uh, we continue our series, Nuggets from the Golden City, with the story today of the Million Dollar Check. Jack? Yes, Dave, the uh, story of the Million Dollar Check is one that uh, involves the sale of the Leroy Mine and the international litigation that took place in three countries and lasted about a year and a half involving this sale. And uh, in effect, uh, it's a bit of a horse opera in a way, and, it, and it's rather interesting. Of course, uh, we recall that the Leroy Mine was discovered in 1890 with the other claims on Red Mountain at that time, and that Colonel Topping had paid $12.50 yeah. recording right. fees and got the Leroy claim. This whole thing started for a, a mere $12.50. Twelve dollars and fifty cents. And worked itself up to three to a million dollars. That's right. Uh, uh, actually, three million. Three million. Yes. Actually, yeah. uh, Topping in turn, of course, sold it for thirty thousand to the Leroy Mining Company, uh, which was formed in Spokane to finance this property. And so he turned a pretty good profit. He then. turned a pretty good profit right off the bat. Yes. Leroy, Leroy paid well all the way through, as you probably have noticed in these series. Anyway, by 1896, Leroy had been developed by the Leroy Mining Company, and they had a contract with Hyants, who built the Smelter Trail here, mm -hmm. and uh, they were producing, and of course, this is the same time that Hyants built his Smelter, the Columbian Western Railway was built from Trail to Roslyn, and the Red Mountain Railway from Roslyn, from Northport to Roslyn. And by 1897, the Leroy Mining Company was paying $25,000 per month's dividends, which is not too bad. And uh, at this time, uh, there were rumors around that there had been uh, a prior offer to buy uh, the Leroy by a Chicago outfit uh, for a half a million dollars, but uh, this had been turned down by the directors mm -hmm. at the time. And uh, this is just about where it starts to get interesting. Uh, and uh, just to summarize a little bit, uh, the president at that time was a Colonel W. W. Payton, and once again, uh, we notice an awful lot of colonels in the development. Were, were these Washington. legitimate colonels, or they were? I, I don't think too many of them were legitimate, <laughs> but it seemed to be a, a handle that was <laughs> very persuasive. <laughs> and Colonel Ridpath represented the uh, Leroy at the Trail Smelter here, and of course Ridpath is a very well-known name in Spokane. Right. And George Turner was the general manager. Now. By October 19, 1897, the Leroy Mining Company had had a disagreement with Heinz. They were not happy with the way that uh, he was treating them here at the Trail Smelter. And uh, they built the Northport Smelter. And this is a very important fact in the litigation that's coming up. And uh, just as an aside, it was uh, <coughs> Bellinger and Breen, who were Heinz, these men who had built the Trail Smelter, deserted him and built this Northport Smelter at the time. But that was the the way things operated in those days. Uh, by this time, of course, the rumors uh, that the directors wanted to sell were really uh, rampant. And uh, there was also a rumor that there was a split occurring in the directorate mm -hmm. because of the difference in asking price for the property. It turns out that they, it actually broke down into two factions. One faction headed up by uh, Turner and the other by Peyton. And these two groups sort of split down the middle. As it turns out, one group wanted to hold out for $5 million, whereas the other group were going to be satisfied to sell for $3 million. You've got to keep, this, this is a fantastic amount of money, and you have to keep in mind that this was back in the 1800s. At the Yes, I it think it would be an unbelievable amount to the average man in those days. I think it'd be about ten to one. I think uh, you're gosh. talking thirty million dollars and fifty million dollars. <laughs> we have to keep this in perspective. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so it was a lot of money in those days, as it would be even now. Now, at about the same time as all this was going on, uh, the Honorable Charles McIntosh, who was Lieutenant Governor of the Northwest Territories, had retired from that post and had gone to England, mm -hmm. where he looked up a boyhood friend named Whitaker Wright, who headed up the London and Globe Finance Company, and persuaded Whitaker Wright that he should set up a, a financial corporation to purchase mining properties in British Columbia and the Yukon. And uh, this they did, and they called it the British America Corporation. And Macintosh was sent to Rossland uh, as managing director of the BAC. And uh, some people may remember the BAC grounds I in Rossland. Just got to bring that up. Right. 
right behind the arena, which yeah. was the office and residences of the British America Corporation. Right. Later on, of course, it was taken over by Consolidated mm -hmm. Mining and Smelling Company, and their people lived in there. Meanwhile, uh, Peyton and Turner had taken off to England to see what they could do about selling the Leroy for their respective prices. Turner was asking five million, and he had no takers. But Peyton had got together with the British America Corporation and Whitaker Wright, and he'd negotiated a three million dollar sale, uh, the details of which were to be worked out later when they got back to Spokane, because Spokane, of course, was the head office of the Leroy Mining Company. And uh, there was a two million down payment, two million dollar down payment made at that time, which was held in escrow in the Bank of Montreal at Roslyn. And this is where the big fight really starts. Uh, the minority group under Turner decided that there's no way they were going to give in to a $3 million price when they, were, they wanted to see a $5 million price. So they blocked the sale. And uh, the majority group immediately invoked the British law that said that the majority of shareholders are entitled to operate the company. The minority group, of course, uh, couldn't do much about that, but they invoked the Washington state law that said there's no way that aliens could hold property in the state of Washington. In other words, the Northport Smeller, which was the Leroy ah, Smeller, there's no right. way that this uh, majority group could take control of that. So, again, uh, this put them up against a, a brick mm -hmm. wall because without the Smeller, uh, the sale wouldn't be very attractive. So at this point, the counsel for the majority, a chap named L.F. Williams, uh, decided that the best thing to do was to pick up all the company seals in the Spokane office, which he did do, and he jumped aboard a train with these seals and fled to Rosslyn and established a, a Rosslyn office. But as I say, this turned into a bit of a comic opera. When he got to Rosslyn, he found that somebody had anticipated his move and they'd switched the seals, and <laughs> the seals that he had, of course, were were useless. They this were not the, not the Leroy Seals at all. This has made a good movie or a TV series. <laughs> this would have made a good TV series. <laughs> anyway, uh, the minority group, uh, realizing what was going on now, decided to get an injunction, which they did do, and this court injunction enjoined the majority group from leaving the country at all. Well, uh, these were all free-willing people, and of course injunctions didn't mean too much mm -hmm. to them. Uh, but the minority group decided they would enforce this, and they hired a special deputy to enforce this. And his job was to stop all the trains out of Spokane for Canada and make sure that none of these people were on it. Now, uh, this is this, almost like a spy thriller. Uh, if this was done today, <laughs> I My don't think that we, it would be tolerated. But here, it was the freewheeling West in those days, yeah. and it, it's one of the exciting stories that is part of the Rossman uh, story. But anyway, Macintosh, not to be undone here decided he, he hired a special locomotive and he put three of his most important shareholders aboard and he told the engineer not to stop until he got to Rosslyn, which he did do. And of course, this left the deputies powerless. They hadn't realized that this locomotive was going to take off all by itself mm -hmm. on the train. Then later on, McIntosh hired a special train for the rest of the party and uh, they boarded the train and were prepared to leave Spokane when uh, Deputy Sheriff Bunce, who was hired by the minority group, came aboard and said, no way. But uh, McIntosh, being a very strong-willed Englishman, finally convinced Chef Sheriff Bunch in very strong language that an Englishman's home was his castle. And in this case, this particular coach on the train uh -huh. was his <laughs> castle. And would he please get out? <laughs> well, apparently Bunch decided that it would be the best move to make. So he did get out, but he, he stayed outside and he held a gun on the crew outside. So of course, they still weren't getting anywhere. <laughs> And this fiasco went on for an hour or two, and finally Austin Corbin, who owned the railway, came down and he ordered the train to move, and somehow or other he convinced Bunce that he should let it move. But uh, Bunce, being a real good deputy sheriff, stuck to his job, and he clung to the steps of the coach for the 140 miles from Spokane to Northport, <laughs> which is a pretty rough ride That's on that railroad. That's what you call perseverance. perseverance. Oh, yes. But when he got to Northport, of course, the... Uh, the border authorities uh, would not let him cross into Canada carrying a dangerous weapon. In other words, if he had done this, he would have been arrested immediately. He crossed the border. So poor old Bunce had to give up and get off the train, and so uh, McIntosh was able to get his party to Rosslyn. Of course, having moved the, the whole of his party to Rosslyn, this meant that the fight 
itself moved into uh, Roslyn and proceeded from there, and it dragged on and on for several months. And then, like all these things, suddenly it was settled with very little fanfare. And uh, <coughs> the minority group were persuaded to go along. There were several resignations which mm -hmm. made this possible. And uh, the final payment was made on the million dollar check written on the Bank of Montreal at Rosland, of which we have a facsimile in the museum at the present time. And one of the interesting things about this check is you've probably seen this picture. In those days, of course, you had to have excise stamps on a check, and depending on the amount of the check, well, the uh, excise stamps are, I would say, six times the area of the check, and this is all pasted to a single sheet of paper. And uh, oh, yeah. it, it's quite a thing. It's all stamps, and then this right. little check in the middle of it all. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> but this was the million dollar check. And, and uh, as we said a minute ago, uh, we're talking really $10 million in today's funds. Yeah. Yes. For one mine. For one mine. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. And, uh, of course, as we saw in our previous programs, uh, uh, the London and Globe Finance Company finance uh, collapsed in 1901, which is another story in itself. It caused a lot of problems in Rosslyn. Mm -hmm. Whitaker Wright committed suicide. And... Uh, the, but the Leroy mine carried on, and it, in 1910 they finally wound up their affairs in London. And in 1911, the Consolidated Mining and Smelling Company picked up the assets of the Leroy and continued to operate it along with the other properties in Roslyn. When did the Leroy finally shut down, Jack? Can you recall? Well, uh, it shut down when when Kaminko's Holdings in Roslyn shut down, which was 1929, mm -hmm. because it was all worked as one big mine: Leroy, Center Star, War Eagle, and the whole bit. We're all one mine. Yeah, a lot of high grade came out of that mine then over there those years. There was a lot of high grade came out of the Leroy, yes. Gold was the prime concern of these people, I guess. Gold was, was the prime concern. The, the Leroy itself produced something like $30 million in gold in its lifetime. Not bad. Not bad. Again, $300 million in today. <laughs> yes, <think>. that's right. <laughs> Another nugget from the Golden City with the help of Jack McDonald of the Roston Museum. <laughs>